You're listening to the winning literary show, Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, live with host Denise Turney, author of the book, Long Walk Up, Portia, Love Pour Over Me, Spiral, Love Has Many Faces, and Rosetta's Great Hope. Turn up your dial and get ready for a blast of feature author interviews, 411 on book festivals, writing conferences, and so much more. Ready? Let's go. Hold the vision. Hold the vision. Trust the process. And that quote is unknown. Hold the vision. Trust the process. That keeps coming up for me here lately. I want to welcome you, welcome you, welcome you. To our loyal listeners, thank you. 17 years. Uh, Man, I I can't even hardly believe it myself. And for those of you who it's your first time tuning in to Off the Shelf, I want to let you know that you absolutely are listening to the winning book podcast off the shelf and welcome to this saturday march 11 2023 you guys for those who are in areas where this happens gotta spring them clocks for the hour it is i forget what time is it midnight or whatever tonight you gotta spring forward daylight savings time starts march the 12th which is tomorrow spring forward to, to 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 make maybe you go to bed an hour earlier so you don't feel like, ooh, I'm missing an hour of sleep. But daylight savings time kicks off tomorrow. And we have today, you just you just came to the right spot. We have an, a wonderful author on deck for you for off the shelf this morning. But before we introduce the that author and they've been on here before. Wonderful, wonderful guests. I want to ask you how good of a mystery sleuth are you? And even more importantly, how much do you value relationships? When people say relationships, they always think romance. You got relationships with your parents, relationships with yourself, relationship with your brothers or sisters if you have siblings, relationships with your neighbors, relationships with your friends, relationships with people who work around you regardless of the job you work, relationships with animals. I mean, there's no way to get out of it. But how much do you value relationships? How important are they to you? And are they important enough to do the work to make them really good for you and everybody involved in the relationship? If you value relationships, because there's a complicated father-son relationship in this story, and there's also relationship with these five guys. They are the best friends. Their friendship lasts from college where they meet, college in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, all the way through their doses. I mean, these are the kind of friends that you like you want to have. But they're not perfect. So if you value, like, the friendships, there's a complicated father-son relationship, as I said, and there's a, I mean, they're really soulmates. There is this romantic relationship that is supposed to happen between Raymond and Brenda. And there's also a murder mystery in this story. If you like mysteries and you value relationships, I encourage you. To get a copy of Love Pour Over Me, it's in print and in ebook. You can get it on ebook for three dollars and ninety nine cent. Kobo, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, you name it. If you don't see it on the shelves, just ask the clerk to get your copy of Love Pour Over Me by Denise Turney, and they can get your copy because it's carried by the largest book distributors in the world. So go gift yourself with a copy of Love Pour Over Me today. And now, let us go and meet today's off-the-shelf podcast guest. And our guest this morning is Terry Brown. She was born in Athens, Greece. At her website, she shares that she came into this world with a mind full of imagination. She loves the outdoors. She particularly loves being close to water. Are you thinking, I'm thinking the United States, Hawaii. Would that be perfect? And in 2020, to raise money for Toys for Tots, her husband and she, they both rode a tandem bike from Astoria, Oregon to Washington, D.C. And she loves to read, help others, support others through mentoring. She likes bargain shopping shopping and ballroom dancing. And she, Terry is the author of the book, Sunflowers Beneath the Snow. And we we, we explored that one more when she was on last time. And it's a, it's just a very intriguing, exciting book, I think, that you'd love to read. So she's the author of the book, Sunflowers Beneath the Snow, and An Enemy Like Me. I encourage you to check Terry Brown out online at T E is T E R I M, just one R, T E R I M 
B R O W N dot com. Again, it's one R T E R I M B R O W N dot com. It's so good to have you back on today. Welcome to Off the Shelf, Terry. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here again. Yeah, enjoyed you last time, especially your story and your your engaging writing and curious to even jump in to, to, for those who didn't catch last show. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll to cover sunflowers beneath the snow, but I really want to get into your your latest book. So for those who didn't, you they, who missed, they missed you in August 2022. Can you tell our listeners where you grew up and what life was like for you growing up, Terry? Yeah, so I I was born in Athens, Greece, because my dad was in the Air Force. Um, and then I did a big portion of my growing up years in Ohio, in Canton, Ohio. Um, and when I was in the middle of uh, my freshman year in high school, my parents moved to North Carolina. Uh, at the time, I hated them for that. Uh, I, I, I could not believe that they were doing that to me. But now I really call North Carolina home. It's where I've been now for, you know, 45 years, and I, I love it here. Um, growing up was, I'd say, pretty typical, standard, you know, leave it to beaver kind of growing up. I mean, we just, I, I don't know, I, I rode my bike and, and played with my friends and stayed out until the street lights came on and and just just lived a nice, happy life with a mom and a dad and a brother. Oh, okay, I'm glad you had a brother. So where you said you went to North Carolina, you were born in Greece. Where are some of the other places that you were fortunate to travel as a daughter of somebody serving in the Air Force? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, my dad got out of the Air Force when I was a very small child. So we, we settled in Ohio and um, then moved to North Carolina. So really those are the only two places that I remember are being oh, okay. in those two locations. Yeah. Did you did – you, I was in the Navy, so I have to ask you, and know, I actually loved being in the Navy. I got married, and that's why I got out, because I didn't want to if I have a family that two people stationed at two different places. But did, exactly. you ever want be to be in the, did you ever want to be in the military yourself? You know, I never did, and I think it's because I have an extremely strong personality, and I couldn't imagine anyone telling me what to do. Like, it really <laughs> – no, I mean, like I think about it. They would, they would have said, Terry, you don't belong here. You need to go home. And I would have said, you're right. And off I would have gone. I just can't imagine that I would have done well in that. Although there's a lot about the military that I, I think is really wonderful. There's, there's so many opportunities available and the travel. I just don't really do well with someone telling me what to do and not giving me a really, really good reason why. Good for you. Good for you. Now. How do you think you traveled a lot? Well, not a whole lot, but you, you. Some people, I know people who've never left the town they grew up in ever, and right. some people have never even really traveled out of there to visit other places. They've always been in the town they were born in, and being born in Greece. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you don't have any memories of Greece. I think I, that would I be don't. cool. Oh, I wish that I did. I really wish. Although I think that, that like way down deep, I must. Because when we lived in Greece, my dad would work three days on and three days off. And on his three days off, my parents would always go to the beach because they didn't have a lot of money, but the Mediterranean is right there. And I spent, you know, three out of every, you know, three days a week at the beach. And I love being near water, particularly Ah. being near an ocean. And I think that there's something about you know, from, from birth, I was there, and, and the water to me is so calming and things. So I think there's a little bit of memory. I just can't tap it, but it doesn't mean it's not there. Okay. How do you think just living in, born in Greece, and it's maybe some part of you does remember, and I would imagine that it would have to, to Ohio, to North Carolina. So you've lived in three different places. You've been around different types of people. How do you think those travels impact your writing, and in particular, how you develop you develop your characters? So, you know, it's interesting. 
when I was, when I went off to college, I think it's the first time that I recognized really how significantly different people can be. Um, you know, when I lived in Ohio, I, of course, I'm living with my parents at that point, and you're surrounded by people that your parents bring into your life. And I'm living in a community that was pretty much just like me. And even when we moved to North Carolina, it was a, it was a significant change for me, and, and it was very difficult at first. But even then, you, you surround yourself usually with people that you feel comfortable with, and people you feel comfortable with tend to be a lot like who you are. And then I went off to college and I met people from different different walks of life that, that had totally different upbringings than I did, who saw life completely differently than I did. And I was amazed. Like, I was just astounded that there were people who had life experiences that were not just different than mine, but significantly different than mine. And, oh, I loved, I loved that ability to learn from these people and to see things differently. Um, so I try to bring all of that into my writing, the idea that everyone everyone has a point of view. And we could, you and I could both be in the same room at the same time experiencing the same thing. And yet what we remember from that experience or what touched us from that experience isn't going to be the same. Because you're going to have come at it from all of your life experiences and I'm going to have come at it from all of mine. So to be able to sit and listen to people describe and talk about the things that mattered to them and why, I love to bring that out in books. I just think that oh makes the characters so well-rounded. I love what you just said. You know, you, you approach – I heard somebody use this example once. They said they took like three – either blindfolded three people, and they put them different parts of an elephant. One, you had to just feel the elephant's tail. Yes. One, just by the elephant. One, the elephant's tusk. And they all came up way with different descriptions. So based on our own, like the people we've born around, our environment and experiences we've had, we're going to see the world completely differently. We're going to see different we things. We are. And so I think that as a writer, taking that into I think that's one of the good things about being a writer who's been grown up around different people and who's traveled. I just think that really is a blessing uh, as a writer. So talking about writing and, and uh, before we start talking about uh, your book, An Enemy Like Me, when you were a little girl, Terry, what did you want to be? What did you dream of becoming uh, when, you, when you grew up? So it's funny. I had three things that I used to tell people I wanted to be. Um, one of them was an author, and you'd think, wow, she really knew what she wanted, except that I also told people that I wanted to be a brain surgeon, but I'm absolutely terrified of blood. So the idea that I thought I wanted to be a brain surgeon is pretty funny. And the other one was I wanted to be an Olympic ice skater, and I am probably oh. one of the klutziest pe- but I'm one of the klutziest people you've ever met. There's no way I would have ever been able to be a- be something like that. But – I did say I wanted to be a writer, and I think the reason that I said I wanted to be a writer is because I love books. Uh, I mean, from the time I – I don't ever remember not reading books and or having them read to me. And I read everything I could get my hands on. I read – there was a series called Trixie Belden, which is kind of like Nancy Drew for younger kids. And I read every one of those, and then I read every Nancy Drew, and then I was angry that Hardy Boys were for boys and not for girls, so I read every one of those as well. And then, I mean, I was just, I loved going to the library and just bringing home stacks and stacks of books. So I think the idea of being an author was simply because, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful to be surrounded by words? But but then... You know, life kind of intervenes, and, you know, you go off to college, and your parents say, no way, are you going to be a writer? That's how you starve to death. And, you know, so you don't – I didn't pursue it, not really because I didn't want it, but because I didn't even know how to make that a reality. Ah, okay. Yeah, life happens. (laughs) Yes, it does. Life happens. It does. And you start start going down a different path. That That is for sure. 
now uh, uh, I, I want to ask you one more thing before we go to enemy an enemy like me. You and your husband right. in 2020, at the heart of COVID, you decided to jump on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> at the heart of COVID, oh my God! Did you take this take this bike ride, this epic bike adventure? Tell us about some of the fascinating places you visited during that bike ride. How many miles was it? How many miles was it? So it was 3,102 miles. Um, We started on the coast of Oregon and rode all the way to Washington, D.C. Yeah, we saw some – oh, the world is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. My husband, he'll tell you that he would get a little – not frustrated, but a little frustrated – because I would see something and say, oh, stop. I have to take a picture. <laughs> and and it got to the point that I'd say, oh, and see, he'd say, I know, I know. Um, we were in one area, um, so we were in, I guess we were in Idaho, and we were coming up over a pass into uh, Montana. And every time we would turn a corner, what I would see was so beautiful that I would say, oh, I've got to get a picture of this. This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Well, I have like 400 pictures of that three-day trek up the mountain because everything was so beautiful to me because it was yeah. it was different. You know, I live in the East Coast, and this was North, I mean, uh, West Coast mountains, and it was just significantly different than all of the wildflowers and the I don't know, but you know what was even more incredible than what I saw were the people that we met. We met so many unusual people from totally different walks of life and different socioeconomic statuses and different belief systems. I mean, I met people who believed in Bigfoot, and I don't mean they believed in it. I don't mean they believed in it like, oh, isn't that funny? I mean they really believed in it, but what is cool is is to, like, talk and, and hear and listen and, and, and start to find out, like, what, what makes them tick. It was, it was the most amazing adventure ever. I, I'm wow. so glad I took it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, what did you, if you had to say the one thing that really jumps out at you, that you learned about yourself doing that right or that, you came back changed. What would be what would be the one thing? Were you more pa- patient, more creative, more curious? What did, what did I, you learn about? So prior to um, getting married to my husband Bruce, I had been in an emotionally abusive relationship for fourteen years, oh. and that that really changes who you are and what you believe about yourself. And although I was out of the relationship and I was I was feeling much stronger and much more like me, that ride proved to me that I could do anything I put my mind to. That if I believed it, if I wanted it, it could be mine. And I came home from that ride and took a manuscript that I had written prior to that ride and I got it published and that became Sunflowers Beneath the Snow. So, Go ahead. Oh my goodness! Yeah. I'm glad I asked so, you that question. Yeah. So oh for yeah, so oh, for wow. me, what it what it yeah for me what it was was I I came out of there believing in me that I knew that that if I wanted it. So the question now is not can I do something. The question is is do I want to? And if I want to, then then I can. And and if I don't want to. That's perfectly fine, too. You don't have to want to do everything. So it's okay to say, well, that that's not for me. But I no longer feel like the answer is, is oh, I, I can't do that. Because oh the truth is, is I can do absolutely anything I put my mind to. Uh, I'm so glad you shared that. I'm so glad you shared that. And we do want to touch on sunflowers beneath the snow. But can you right for now introduce off-the-shelf listeners to your new book, An Enemy Like Me. Can you give us a brief overview of the of the book? Yeah. So An Enemy Like Me is a World War II genre, but it really focuses um, more on the people who fight in the war and those that are left behind. Jacob is the soldier. He's a first-generation German-American. So his parents moved to 
to the United States, and then he was born here. And he meets Bonnie, who is someone that, that he doesn't believe that he's good enough for, but they fall in love, and they have a child, and he believes that he's kind of headed for his happily ever after. And then World War II kind of jumps in the way. And he realizes how much people dislike Germans because of what's going on in Nazi Germany. And he begins to fear for his family because there's a lot of anti-German sentiment and, you know, he doesn't want that to be a, a problem for his family. And so he really thinks about going and fighting in the war. He eventually does go to fight um, as a way of, of, you know, protecting his family from, from all of this. But he believes he's going to fight the Japanese. And in his mind, this is an enemy he can get behind because they don't look like him. They don't talk like him. They don't eat the same foods that he eats. He ends up in uh, the European theater and fighting against the Germans. And so the title, An Enemy Like Me, is when he recognizes he's more wow. like the enemy than he is different. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's so perfect the way you... The way you shared that, so he's born, he's born in Germany, and he's no, he's his parents go. are born in his parents are born in Germany. He was born in the United States, but he's a first generation United States, and then off he goes to fight in a war. He ends up in Germany. You know, even though he was born in the United States, his family speaks German. His family eats German foods, right? Because they're German. And so he he realizes he's one generation away from being on the other side of that war. Wow. Very interesting. Why did his parents then, when and why did his parents leave Germany and come to Ohio? Yes, so we we don't ever explore that in the book, but during that period of time there were a lot of uh, Germans coming to America. World War I had already happened, and... You know, it was bad for Germany, and things were bad in Germany. There were a lot of people looking for a better life. And so it was not uncommon for people to come to the United States for various reasons to get a better life. And for some reason, his parents chose to do that. And then he was born. He was born right around the time of the uh, First World War. So, you know, his parents were kind of looking around saying, things aren't good here, let's get out. And I, I would think it would be for the same reason that we currently have people who come to the United States. You know, they look around where they are and they think, I would have a better life somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so they emigrate, and that's that's what his parents did. Uh, describe Jacob Miller. What What's he like? Is he single? Is he married? How old is he? What is his? What drives him? What's he like? So Jacob. Yeah, so Jacob, when we meet him, we actually meet him as an infant, but we only see him as a small child for just a little while. The the majority of the time, we see Jacob either as single and dating Bonnie, who becomes his wife, or married and now uh, uh, with a, a child. So when he goes off to war, he is a married man with a child. And his whole purpose for going off to war is because he's trying to make sure that his wife and his child are safe. Okay. And then now I wanted to ask you, oh, well, more about him. He seems like he Mm -hmm. sees himself as, and it's the 1940s for our listeners. It's very different than, of course, it is today. But he sounds like he puts it on himself. I've got to take care of of my family. Is he short tempered? Is he if you had to describe him, is he is he is he got a good sense of humor? Is he short tempered? Does he have any like quirks about him? If somebody were to he, meet him and you were Yeah, so if you were to meet him, I mean I think you would like him immediately. He's he's a little bit shy, um, not super sure of himself, but he oh he loves his wife and he no he has a, he he is like the patience of Job he just he just doesn't have any he just seems like a really great guy but when when he comes home from the war he's changed and he's he's not as patient and he's a little more short tempered and it's because he's seen things now that have you know changed who 
who he is fundamentally because, you know, he's seen things that, that were hard to see. But when you meet him in the beginning, no, he's just a great, great guy, but really shy. And he is so tortured over the fact that he loves Bonnie. He knows he falls in love with her the moment he sees her. And yet he can't even ask her out because he's just so so shy. So how how old is Jacob and how old is Bonnie when they meet? And where do do they meet? Do they meet like at a country fair or something? How do they meet? How old are they when they meet? So they're in they're in their late teens, uh, like nineteen. He is a grocery delivery boy, and he delivers groceries to her house. That's how he meets her. Oh. Then he spends the next several months doing everything he can to make sure he's the one that delivers her groceries. Oh. <laughs> and he even goes so far as he realizes that she likes oranges, and he is in charge at the store of kind of like going through the fruit and getting rid of any fruit, well, sometimes he will get rid of an orange that shouldn't be gotten rid of, and then he'll put it in her basket so that she gets more oranges. Oh, how sweet. He must have had to have gotten his nerve up to ask her out, or did she just get on the nose? He does. Okay. No, he eventually gets it. He eventually gets up the nerve and, and, Hopefully everyone finds it as funny as I did. I mean, you know, he's like sweating. He's holding flowers. They're they're all crunched over. He he's just he's a wreck. He's an absolute wreck because he doesn't believe. You know, she's someone who can can get groceries delivered. He's a delivery boy. You know, he's like there's no way that this is ever going to work. And she's beautiful, and he's handsome, but he doesn't know it. You know, he he's never considered himself, you know, anything. He hasn't ever dated. He's never kissed a girl. And he's just totally enamored by Bonnie. You've got a lot of things going on in this story I find interesting, okay? His family's immigrated to the United States after World War I uh, from Germany, and then he's got to go back there, and he's thinking he's going to fight somebody who's not like him, and he ends up doing that, and what all comes how he changes after the war. But now there's this economic, and I'm thinking of this movie I saw years ago. Um, it was a wonderful love story. And it was about this couple. They were Their economic level was so different. that The, the one from money, she didn't want her daughter to be involved with this guy at all, but she fell so in love with him. I think it was a book Nicholas Sparks. Nicholas Sparks is somebody who wrote. But anyway, I wanted to ask you, so, for our listeners, Jacob, what does his family do, and what type of, would you say they're poor, or from just a financial they're definitely, perspective? And yeah, what they're does definitely Bonnie's family poor. do, and how much okay, money would so, touch her? Yeah, so what's interesting is, Bonnie, I mean, Jacob's father dies when Jacob is a uh, an infant. He's in an accident, uh-huh. and he dies. So the mother is now you have to remember, she's an immigrant. She doesn't speak English. Um, Mm. She now has a two-year-old son, and she has to figure out how to care for him. So she she starts baking and and making candies and taking in laundry and, like, doing anything that she can do to take care of her son. And as soon as he's old enough, he actually goes and works on a farm for a while because she can't afford to feed him. It's the, the, during the Depression, and, you know, she can hardly feed him. So she farms him out this, this, to this farmer who feeds him and gives him a little bit of money for all the work that he does. And, you know, in her mind, at least he's being fed, right, because she wasn't sure she could do it. So he, he's now come home, um, and he's working as a, a grocery clerk, and she's still, you know, baking and making candies. Bonnie, on the other hand, she's currently working as a typist, but her family was extraordinarily wealthy until the Great Depression, and they lose all their money. So despite the fact that she's as poor as he is right now, she doesn't believe she's poor. You know, in her mind, she's still the wealthy girl. And she still believes that she's going to eventually go back to being the wealthy girl. 
because she grew up with butlers and maids and a yacht. And her dad lost everything. Oh, my God, you got so much going on in this story. This is one thing I love about doing these uh, these interviews with authors on off the shelf. It, it, you listen to the author describe it, and you're like, i got to go out and get that book. It's, there's so many layers to it. And there's, there's no way as an author to write the, in the description all of this, so you'd have a forever description. I don't know how you include all these different dynamics and layers, but there's so many layers in an enemy like me. Now, I want to know a little bit more about Bonnie and to, to tell our listeners a little bit more about her. After she and Jacob marry, is she totally dependent on Jacob? She, and I'm thinking part of my, in my mind, the 1940s, she's coming from wealth. She had maids and butlers. She might, might not be used to really working. Is she totally dependent on Jacob after they married? And is she confident? Does she have self-confidence? Because he's going off the war. She must be terrified. And does she pour right. herself into Jacob and her child? What is Bonnie like? So Bonnie is, when you first meet Bonnie, a lot of people said, oh, I didn't like her at first. And I think the reason that people don't like her at first is because she kind of comes off a little bit snobby, you know, like I'm wealthy, even though she's not. You know, she still has that kind of snobby. But as you get to know her, you recognize, now there's a lot to her. And she's really smart, and she's really willing to work. Even as a child, she had this ability to decorate, and we see that in, in a scene young before her family loses the money. She has a really good eye where she can look at something and she knows what should go together and what colors work well together and you know how to really create a style. But well, once she and uh, Jacob get married, she goes to a store and realizes that the, the displays that they're doing are terrible. That, that it isn't attracting anyone's attention. And she very much wants a piece of furniture from the store, but they can't afford it. So she goes in and she talks with the owner, and she gets permission to do window displays. And if enough people make a comment about this window display, he'll hire her to continue doing his displays. Oh my. And instead of, instead of payment she'll get credits towards that piece of furniture that she wants. Oh, okay. And her husband isn't real sure how he feels about this because he's been brought up to believe that he should be the breadwinner, right? And it's kind of like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you doing? But on the other hand, he recognizes that his wife has a lot of talent and he realizes that the two of them together are really going to, you know, like shake the world. So she ends up, getting, you know, getting the job, and she ends up getting that piece of furniture that she wants. And then when the war hits, and and he's going off to war, she knows that she can do what needs to be done, but she doesn't want to have to. I mean, she loves him. She, she'd rather he be there than be somewhere else. Um, but she she goes back to typing. That's what she does when he uh, goes off to war is – she goes and lives with her family because it's easier that way. Her mother is going to now take care of her son, who's not yet in school. And um, she and her father go work at the same plant. He does something, and she works in the typing pool. Interesting. So. Oh, my goodness. I can just see this story. And then, and then the characters, you know, the characters drive the story, the changes you see, how they interact with each other and how exactly. they they change each other and then, then then experiences like a war is massive. There's massive change coming out of something like that, which leads me to my next question. How does, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, Jacob's shy. He wants to take care of his family. He's just head over heels up for Bonnie, and I can only imagine he just adores their son. Oh, how old is the baby when Jacob goes into war? So when... Um, the U.S. goes to war, his son is a year old. When Jacob finally goes to war, his son is four. Okay. So he wrestles with it for three years. Ooh, you're just like, oh, God, don't call me up. Hope they don't call me up. How does yeah, Well, you war... know, it... Go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. No, what I was going to say is, is, you know, he... 
he wrestled with it because part of him very much wanted to go and fight and prove that he is a patriotic American. Because there were a lot of people who didn't like German Americans at this point. They were afraid of them because what if they were Nazi sympathizers and what if, what if they wanted Germany to win this war? And he didn't want that for his family. On the other hand, he wanted to stay home with his wife and son. And so he had a struggle for three years. He eventually decided that fighting was something he needed to do in order to keep his family safe because he believed that people were going to start looking at them as though they were not truly Americans. So he went to well, war to prove, to prove who he was. Were they the only germ? Oh, so he didn't have to go. No. Oh. Very interesting. And very, very during interesting. World, during World War II, a lot of people didn't have to go. They chose to go. There were a lot of people that, that as soon as um, Pearl Harbor was bombed, there were lines for days of people who were signing up to go into the war. Um, and so, you know, not everyone who fought in that war was, you know, conscripted to go. And he wouldn't have had to go because he was married and he had married a child. and had a child. That's what I was thinking. And Inter- he, right, and he also inter- right, and he also had an occupation. At this point, now he's begun working in a, a lumber yard, and being able to provide the lumber and other things was one of those things that people needed so he was in a an occupation that would have also allowed him to stay home from the war because you could say what he was doing was war effort you know like like what he was doing for a living but yet he felt he needed to go are they the only germans in their neighborhood no so he lives in in a neighborhood that is pretty much german american now when they get married they don't live in the in the very same neighborhood that he grew up in, and so it's probably less Germanic, but still that whole area. Um, so it's North Canton, but it used to be called New Berlin. The whole area is pretty much settled by German Americans of various generations. You know, some who have been there for two hundred years, and others who are brand new to the area. Oh, my God, this story just got interesting. I, the, I mean, not just got interesting, a lot more. I thought he had to go, but then I'm thinking to myself, I forget what after what war they changed that. that if you're married and have a child, you don't have to go. Right, but, uh, right. Yeah, he, he went on his own. Without giving a story away, because I'm, I'm thinking this is where the, the this is where the core of the story might lie, without giving it away. I mean, you so much you've told with it just is a story you want to read, an enemy like me. How does the war, again, without giving the story away, you said a little bit, you alluded to it a little bit earlier, but how does it change Jacob and his relationship? Of course it's going to change him, but his relationship with his wife and their young son. Is he more appreciative of them when he comes home? Just He just really wants to absorb himself and, and get in their lives, and they're like the centerpiece of his life now. How does the war change his relationship with Bonnie and their son? So you see when he comes home from war that she listens very carefully to some of the things that he's experienced, and it it has hurt him deeply because he recognizes that he's more like that enemy than he is different from the enemy. You know, he... This enemy that he went to fight, the, he's in Germany fighting. He thinks he's going to fight the Japanese. He ends up fighting the Germans. And he realizes these people are like, like my neighbors. Mm. You know, they're, they're just like me. And so it was a very hard thing for him to, to find a way to be able to fight in this war. Um, but when he comes home, although he and Bonnie remain very close, Jacob has a hard time really connecting with his son again. Um, he he loves him. It isn't that he doesn't love him. I think that he just has so many demons. You know, and if you, if you look at a lot of um, soldiers who come home from war, uh, the PTSD keeps them separated. 
You know, it's almost like they're afraid to give too much of themselves because if they do, you know, what might happen? And so he and his son never really connect again the way that they had before. Uh, And that's, you see, you see a lot of that. And that's kind of some of the crux of the story towards the end. How old is his son when he comes back? Six. Oh, he's only over there for two years. Oh, my God. Yeah. And in that that two years, well, yeah, and in that two years, though, you figure they didn't hear from him very often. It's not like today where you could Skype someone. You know, they got letters, and the letters sometimes were months apart. Yeah. Because oh that's the way things were. And so, yeah, he didn't have his dad for two years. Oh, this book, An Enemy Like Me by Terry Brown. Oh, my goodness. Now, did you research World War Two? Before or while you were writing An Enemy Like Me? And if not, where did you get the material from the, for the story? Yeah, so I do a lot of research. I love research. I tell everyone I'm a research junkie. Um, and But I knew a lot about World War II because it's an era that I love to read about. I, you know, watched a bazillion movies, um, documentaries. My grandfather fought in World War II, so it's always been of an interest to me. Um, and... So, yeah, but I did a lot of research mostly to make sure that what I was saying would really work. I wanted Jacob to think that he was going to fight the Japanese and end up in Germany. So I started doing research to see if that was even possible. Like, was it possible to think you're going one place and then end up somewhere else? And I found a unit that had been trained to fight the Japanese, and then at the last minute, that unit was put to the um, Western Front instead and sent over into the European theater. And so I made sure I attached him to that unit so that it would work, so that he could end up in Germany, because it was really important to me that he start out with this idea that he knows who the enemy is and then realizes, wait a minute, uh, I am the enemy. I mean, he's oh one generation God. away from being on the other side of the war. If his parents oh had not left, goodness. he would be wearing a German uniform. Uh, who are, who introduced us to some of the other, a few of the other major and minor characters who move uh, the story and enemy like me forward? So we see um, Jacob's mother. Um, she is... Oh, she is a mean, harsh woman. A lot mm. of I I don't even really care for her, but I understand her. You know, she she moved to the United States with her. Uh, she I don't know if she I don't even remember if I said she moved here with him or they got married when they got here. But she's here. She's married. She has a baby. When her baby is two years old, he dies in an accident, and now she's oh. a widow in a foreign country. And everything she does, she does for her son. And then when her son falls in love and gets married, she can't handle it. Because she feels like she's losing the one, the only thing that attaches her to her late husband. Um, so she's a, she's a real character. She's really kind of difficult. We meet Bonnie's parents. Um, they're... You kind of are surprised by how how little her mother really knows, like, how to do, because she was wealthy. And now she's, you know, living in this tiny little house and having to figure out how to cook. Like, she's never even had to cook for herself before. So we see a little bit of that as she tries to figure out, you know, what is what is life when you don't have a servant to take care of it? Um, who else do we meet? Oh, there is the, the storekeeper character that we meet who kind of helps Bonnie and Jacob when they're first married and helps them get the furniture and eventually provides them uh, an apartment that they can stay in that's much better than the one that they had been in before. And Yeah, so those are some of the characters. Oh, there's also the farmer. Now, this is one of my favorite characters. I can't believe I almost forgot him, but the farmer that um, he, that Jacob was sent to, 
his name was Axel. And when Jacob wants to go to war, as soon as soon as, as the um, Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor, Jacob immediately wants to go to war and doesn't want to go to war. Like, he's really torn. He doesn't know what he should do. So he goes and he talks to Axel. And it's the only time you meet this man, and they have a great conversation. And he's just very pragmatic and essentially says, you're right. People are going to have to fight in this war, but does it have to be you? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, you know, war, where, war changes oh, people. So yes, <laughs> a lot of a lot of big events happen in your life, and you're like, you can't go back. You can't go back right. to where you were. You have to you have to build a new life. It's it's a exactly. lot of things can happen to you. You just you can't go back. You have to build a new life. Where and where or oh, where did you get the idea? I'm listening to you describe the characters, major minor characters. What happens? Well, Jacob thought he's going to fight an enemy. He thinks he can't fight because this person's not. And we all human. We all are alike. Period. But he's more comfortable that way. And then he's oh, I'm fighting people who are just like me. All of it, all the the Bonnie family, her background very different from Jacob's, but how their background now starts to merge is after the, uh, uh, the the depression, the stocks fall, and her father loses everything. All these different things that now are linking. Where did you get the idea for this story, an enemy like me? Well, my grandfather fought in World War II, and we are of German background. But we've lived in the United States since the 1700s. So when he fought in World War II in Germany, I would have never thought that that would have been something that was, you know, even even would be bothersome. Well, he told me one time, I was a teenager, and he said, I always wondered if the person on the other side of my gun was a cousin. Oh. Oh. And that oh. Had- stuck with me for all of these years. So when I was kind of searching around in my mind for, like, what would be a good storyline, that came to me, and I thought, what if I made the character first-generation German-American, not not several generations in, but first-generation, where the person on the other end of his gun could really be a cousin. Oh, my God. Like, really could be a cousin. And that's kind of where that story started. Oh, my goodness. What have readers, what have you been hearing from readers about an enemy like me? I have gotten a lot of people who really seem to be able to connect because they'll say, my grandfather was in the war, my father was in the war, my great-grandfather was in the war. Or even people who are currently in the military who say things like, no one ever talks about the wives and the children. Mm. You know, they only talk about they only talk about the soldier, but they never talk about what war does to those left behind. So I'm getting a lot of really great comments like that. So that's really exciting. We have oh my goodness, I could go on talking about an enemy like <laughs> me. What a story! And then that what you just said about you could with your grandfather. Oh my goodness. It's just like I felt something literally pierce me when you said that. Could you give us an, oh, we don't even have long to talk about the next book, but could you give us a brief overview of Sunflowers Beneath the Snow? Yeah, so Sunflowers Beneath the Snow is about three generations of Ukrainian women. It begins in Soviet Ukraine in the early 1970s and kind of goes through to the present. Um, it the 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 final scene that you see is shortly after Russia invades Ukraine in 2014 when they um, invade the Crimea Peninsula. Um, the book came out three and a half weeks before the current Ukrainian crisis. Oh, so my goodness. The, the, yeah, the timing was just totally bizarre. Um, and people have asked me, how did you know? And it's like, no, 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 that's not the way it worked. I wrote that book in 2018 and finally got it published in 2020. 2022, and I said, you know, that's so it doesn't work that way. Um, but yeah, you follow these three women, and you see how um, the oldest generation. She was married. Her husband was a rebel. He made a decision to to spy. He got caught, 
and we see what that decision that he made and how it changed the next generations of his family. And we follow them all the way through. Oh, as a thing. And our choices, our choices, yeah. this is they choose again, our choices. Introduce us to Miss Ivanya. What is she like? She is. Of, of the characters, most people don't like her the most. I hope oh. that they come to love her when they see her with her granddaughter. But she's she's harsh. But you have to look at what her life has been. She had a husband and a daughter, and her life seemed to be going well. Her husband is is, you know, jerked out of her life. And she's left trying to figure out what to do with her daughter. And she's she's living in a communist country. And the only thing that really has saved her is communist programs. They gave her a job. They're the ones that got her daughter into school. They're the ones that have given her an apartment. They're the ones that give her coupons for food. And so she becomes a real party loyalist. And I think that's what a lot of people have trouble understanding is, is why why would anyone be loyal to the Communist Party? And it is hard for those of us in the United States in particular to understand because, you know, we're, we believe so strongly in freedom and independence. And But if you've never had it and all you know is I get my milk and bread from the government and you don't know anything else, then it's what you cling to because – Anything else is scary. And that's something I hope that people really understand is, you know, it's easy for us to point fingers and say, well, there's no way. I would never do that. I would, I would, I would. You have no idea what you would do until you're in that situation because sometimes survival is more important than ideals. And so you just do whatever's necessary, right? I mean, we all often do whatever's necessary. You just, that's what life is sometimes. And, you know, you've got these great ideals, and they go right out the window when you're starving to death. Yeah. What's her relationship right? with her daughter like? Is she, so do they have a time, loving? Well, there are, yes and no. There are times where, where I mean, obviously, uh, Ivana loves her daughter, Betsy, very much. But if Betsy is that younger generation who, who kind of has a little bit of a rebellious, and she wants to see Ukraine free. And so politically, she and her mom are on different pages, and they actually go through a period of time where they do not speak. You know, the mother is so distraught at some of her daughter's ideas that she just can't, she just can't be with her. But in the end, we find they live together in the same house now. Um, Yvetsi has gotten married, and, and now there's going to be a child. And uh, Yvonne is living with them. And even though they're politically in different places, you see how they, they learn to navigate with one another because they love each other so much. That it's perfectly okay to love someone and not agree with them. Yeah. yeah. What inspired you, know, which you is, to write? Which is something. Uh, go go ahead. ahead. No, no, no. You no, said I was going to say, which is, which, is, yeah, which is something we need to understand in today's world. Oh, absolutely. You know that it's okay, that it's okay to to be friends with to love people who don't agree completely with everything you agree. It's perfectly okay. You yeah, because who's hundred percent right? <laughs> what? what yeah, really? You? Well, I, no, go ahead. So what inspired me? So now this story actually has a little bit of truth to it. Um, oh. I have a friend. Uh, really, it's what my daughter's friend who came to the United States. Um, she came to come for the summer and ended up not being able to go home. She was from Ukraine. And, the, and when it came to be August and it was time to go home, Russia had invaded, and she couldn't go home. Um, she ended up remaining in the United States. And in 2016, she came to my home, and we were chatting, and she told me this incredible story. And it was so compelling that I tell everyone I wrote 82,000 words of fiction to tell three pages of truth. Mm. Wow! So I'm not going to tell you what the truth is, or it will ruin the story. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, so you you write these multi-layered these these characters, and you and you and it's, you you 
have your major characters, they're going to undergo a massive transformation. It's just it, right, it, it, and it's something that the reader can enjoy watching happen. Although I'm so sure some readers are like, no, 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 don't change that character. <laughs> <laughs> it's still with the story. What? Yeah. What writing process do you follow, Terry? Do you do character sketches, outlines, as you start building out your story? I, you know, I I wish that I were that person because it would make answering this question so much easier, but I am a total panster. I sit down. Usually I like to go to a writer's retreat where no one is bothering me and I have two weeks all to myself, and I will write a first draft in two weeks. I just write the story, and I get it out of my head. Then comes the harder work where I, you know, fill it out and flesh it out and, you know, make sure that my characters have enough depth and that they've had enough hardship and you see how they overcome it and all of those other things. But that first draft, I haven't done any character development at all. I have characters that that are in my head that start clamoring and telling me this story, and it's like I've got to let it out. And so I just write until the story's out. Uh, and I know a, a lot of authors who do that. Now as we come down to just four minutes, can you share three to four steps you've taken that you found to be effective for you at getting the word out about your books? Oh, so number one is podcasting. I mean, it has been absolutely wonderful because – I get to talk one-on-one, but then I get to, you know, project out to all of the listeners. And so it's a really wonderful way. Um, Other ways to get my book out, I mean, social media. I love to do in-person things, so I love to get groups of people together and just talk about books and writing and that book in particular or, or anything. And so I think those are some of the best ways, at least for me, um, you know, some people don't feel comfortable doing the, the in-person events or even talking on a podcast, but I love to talk, and I love to talk about books and reading and writing, so it's a really good way for me. So any way that I can actually use my voice is, is, is a good way for me to get my books out. And are you working on any other new books? If so, can you give us a quick glimpse into what you're working on? Yeah, so I'm working on a book that I'm calling The Granny Woman. At least that's what I'm calling her right now. And A Granny Woman is a um, is a healer in the Appalachian Mountains. She's often the midwife. She always knows about the roots and the herbs. And then there's also a little bit of, of what I'm going to call mountain magic, that, that belief that she has a gift. And because she believes it and everyone else believes it, she's able to do things that seem kind of magical, like like whisper to a, a woman's um, belly and get her baby to flip over who's been breached, or to talk to a burn and, and talk the heat out of that burn so that it doesn't leave scars, and all kinds of things that, that I have found that these healing women in the mountains of North Carolina have the ability to do. And so I'm going to be dealing with her. Her name is Maggie. And she has a daughter who thinks that she's completely crazy, and she becomes a, a medical nurse. And so we see the differences between a modern medicine and the mountain medicine that her mother practices. Oh, my goodness. What's the name of it again? It's a work you're working well, I'm calling it. Yeah, so I'm calling it the granny woman because that is the Appalachian title for someone who did healing in the mountains like that. They, they were called granny women. So I'm calling it the Granny Woman right now as the working title, and I don't I don't know what's going to stick, but that's where it is at the moment. That sounds very. And you come up with great story ideas. Where can off the Where can off the shelf listeners get a, a copy of your books? An Enemy Like Me and Sunflowers Beneath the Snow. Well, you can go to my website, which is my name TerryMBrown.com, and that's Terry with one R. You can also go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, pretty much anywhere that books are sold. And by all means, go to my website, sign up for my newsletter, um, reach out on my contact page, follow me on all my social media. All that's on the website. Oh, my goodness. Oh, This is the second time we've had her on, and both times have been very different, at at least for me. We, we, We covered sunflowers beneath the snow in depth. Last time, and we barely touched on it this time, but An Enemy Like Me, but it's her latest book. 
Uh, and and that granny, another one, the great story ideas. We have had the pleasure off the shelf listeners of, of interviewing and just, just connecting with Arthur Terry Brown. And she's the author of the book Sunflowers Beneath the Snow and an Enemy Like Me. She's working on her new book, which will be in that, like the Appalachian Mountains. You can check Terry out online at Terry com. That's T E R I. M B R O W N dot com one R T E R I M B R O W N dot com. Go check her out and get a copy of An Enemy Like Me and Some Flowers Beneath the Snow. Thank you so much, Terry, for taking time out of your day to be with us here and our off the shelf listeners on this Saturday morning. And to our listeners, thank you so much, especially our loyal listeners for tuning in and joining us. Remember to mark your calendars. Saturday mornings, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or New York City Time. You're going to tune in and catch these awesome guests on Off the Shelf Books podcast, Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And as a, and remember to set your clock forward if you were to practice daylight savings times. Not every place does. but And remember that you are awesome. You're incredible. You're so amazing. Go out and create a wonderful, wonderful day for yourself today. Terry, I'll send you a link to the show when it finishes streaming. Thank you again. Bye for now. Thank you so much. Bye.